What does it mean to be critical, to write a critical review of an experiment or a paper reporting an experiment? When we hear the word critical, or when the layperson hears the word critical, they might think that it means to criticise, to uh, look at a piece of work and point out all the flaws, to say, that's all rubbish, it's completely wrong. That's not what it means to be critical. As a professional scholar, to be critical means to offer critique. It means to weigh not just the weaknesses, but also the strengths of a piece of work. It means to put it in context. It means to understand the limitations on what could plausibly have done by a scientist like yourself and come to a balanced view of uh, the, the good things, the bad things, and the possibilities for improvement of any piece of work. So the difference between uh, the professional understanding of uh, being critical and the layperson understanding of being critical is the difference between a cynic and a sceptic. So here's Oscar Wilde. He said, a cynic knows the price of everything but the value of nothing. The cynic doesn't care about the evidence. They just say that things are worthless. A sceptic cares deeply about the evidence. They want to be persuaded. They can't be persuaded unless you make a reasonable argument, a logical argument, and you show them the evidence. But they want to be persuaded. So that's the difference between a, a, a false understanding of what it means to be critical and the, the uh, kind of critical you need to be when you're asked to provide a critical review or a critical assessment of a paper. Let's go into a bit more depth on smart ways to be critical. So I think that there are real th really three levels of criticism um, uh, and in an ascending order uh, of uh, skill that they take and kudos that they deserve if you can manage. And I'm going to uh, talk you through that. And these are relevant for this course, I243, but they'll help with all the lab reports you ever write and especially when you're being critical of your own work in your own projects or your, your final year uh, dissertation projects. So the first level of criticism is just to mention weaknesses of a study, the things that are generally uh, applicable to all studies as, as flaws or limitations. And we all know what kind of things those are from studying psychology. It's things like you didn't test enough people, you only used particular stimuli, and we don't know if that, uh, those stimuli will generalise. The participants are a homogenous group, for example, they're often psychology students. It's not clear if the study will generalise to a real-world uh, application case. We're not clear about the ecological validity. It's good to be aware of those limitations. It's vital to be aware of those limitations when you're designing research. But it's not particularly smart to point those limitations out for a study. Why not? Because these things are true of almost all studies. We always could have tested more people. We're never sure if it's going to generalise perfectly. It's very hard to design uh, an ecologically valid experiment which will generalise to all real-world test cases. And often we only get to test one particular group of people. So the next level of criticism, to go one smarter, is to focus your energies on writing and thinking about specific weaknesses. So these are things that uh, are limitations of the study and you have reasonable grounds for thinking they are relevant to the particular study. So these could be the same things that you might mention under general weaknesses, but you have to show that you've evaluated the particulars of the study you're looking at and come to a reasonable conclusion that one of these general limitations is specifically relevant. So, the criticism that they didn't test enough people. If in the, um, the results of an experiment there looks like there's a difference between two of the experimental conditions, but there's not enough um, uh, statistical uh, power to show that there, re there is a difference, but maybe if you tested more people there would be, then it's a good criticism to point out that they didn't test enough people. They didn't have enough statistical power. The results are ambiguous. You're not clear whether there is a difference, but you haven't got enough uh, numbers, or if the, uh, the, the difference you do see is just the result of random variation. 
or um, if you're going to make the criticism that the study population is unrepresentative, you need to uh, back that up with some words about why the psychological phenomena being tested might not generalize to a different population. If your psychological uh, uh, study you're reviewing is a study of um, line perception, say, some basic psychophysical visual function, there's no reason to think that students will have particularly uh, different basic visual function than uh, many, of, uh, many people in the general population. But if you were studying something like sleep had habits, say, maybe we could argue that students might be systematically different in their sleep habits than uh, older people or people uh, with uh, more constraints on their time. So it all depends. It's not that the limitations you already know about and first come to mind uh, shouldn't be mentioned as specific weaknesses, but selecting which ones are most plausible, most likely to have caused confounds in the study you're reviewing. It's what marks out this second better level of criticism. But you can improve on this, because you, you can make a, a, um, a, the third and best level of criticism, in my opinion, is specific weaknesses and suggestions on how whether you can check if these specific weaknesses apply um, or mentioning a specific weakness and make a suggestion for how a follow-up study could remove that particular weakness. Um, so uh, let's just pick an example from the paper we looked at last week. So if you remember this was um, a study of um, learning rates and forgetting rates and the argument was made that the uh, although the rate of forgetting between the different groups varied the rate of learning didn't vary and therefore other factors apart from rate of learning were affecting rate of forgetting well I wasn't sure about that I thought maybe there was some evidence that between the groups there was um, some variation in rate of learning that's my specific weakness of the study that I, I picked up on. Uh, to take that criticism to the next level, you could make a suggestion for a kind of analysis that would check whether there really was an influence of rate of learning on rate of forgetting. So you could do another study, of course, or you could reanalyzing the existing data. The graph we were shown in the paper only shows the group difference in rate of learning but there would have been individual differences in the rate of learning. So there would have been some individuals who learn fast and some who learn slow in all groups. You could analyse at an individual level whether there was a correlation between rate of learning and rate of forgetting. That wasn't the main focus of the study. That's why they didn't. But if you read that study and you think that the claims particularly on that issue are not convincing, um, suggesting a way that uh, the exact nature of the relationship between learning and forgetting could be analysed and with the data they've already got is extra impressive. So those are um, that's the, the difference between uh, the, uh, a, a lay person's understanding of being critical and the, the kind of critical that we want you to deploy um, as professional psychologists and uh, and the walkthrough of three different levels of criticism uh, and in, in order of uh, the difficulty they are to do and the uh, credit that you receive for doing them they are general pointing out general weaknesses pointing out specific weaknesses and best of all and hardest of all pointing out specific weaknesses and making suggestions for how those uh, limitations could be uh, addressed or tested.